Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, let me say that all the presidential appointees uh, share your goals and want to thank you uh, for your very effective management of our meeting today, which I think was very productive. Um, let me say uh, one thing to uh, explain my own confusion at the statement that the National Academy of Sciences doesn't endorse sampling for non-response. This is the National Academy of Sciences preparing for Census 2000 interim report number two of June 1997, which is the last, as I understand it, statement made by the NAS on the subject. I am reading from page six. We do not believe that a census of acceptable accuracy and cost is possible without the use of sampling procedures for both non-response follow-up and integrated coverage measurement. That strikes me as an endorsement. On the other hand, I don't want to be a deconstructionist, uh, but text is text, and uh, perhaps uh, however, uh, however much a chore it may seem, perhaps it's time to bring the National Academy into the room and into these proceedings and to uh, hear from them straightforwardly about what it is they do and they don't support, and I think particularly who they are, who appointed them, who asked them into this, and as Monty Python used to say, who made you king? Uh, perhaps this is the right time to uh, delve into the arcane world of statistics. Uh, Dr. Chaika today uh, gave demographers and statisticians everywhere uh, a very good boost uh, in terms of being interesting to the point and the like, and we're taking a run of luck if we ask a large number of them to appear before us, <laughs> but perhaps it's time to take that risk. The word count has a great emotional burden associated with it. It, uh, it speaks to what we think of about the census, and uh, it has a kind of pristine meaning that seems so terribly intuitive. I remember once a very honorable and very respected member of uh, the House of Representatives when I was testifying back when I was undersecretary so many years ago, uh, said if you went to the bank and they were to give you $100 and came across the teller's desk, would you count it? And my honest answer was, well, it depends. You know, have I t gone to this bank before? Do I have recourse? Is it in ones, fives, or tens? And uh, so on. So, but I think that the intuitive answer is, if someone says, here's a hundred bucks, Ev, that you would count it. What if I gave you $260 million and I told you you had an hour and a half to decide whether or not I gave you the right amount? You would weigh it. You would do anything, but you wouldn't count it because you would only know whether or not the first 14 or 1,500 of the $260 million were there in front of you. The Census Bureau is in that position. It's been told to go out and to count the 260 million odd Americans. I didn't say there were that many Americans who were odd, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> I reserve the right to edit the transcript for my syntactual garble. Uh, but to take that number of people and to count them and to do it with the clock running. And that requires a variety of judgments that have to combine the soundness of statistical theory with the Bureau's experience of working in the field, our knowledge about administrative records, our knowledge about what goes on in local communities, and to combine them into the best possible effort to get the right number. There was a Dear Colleague letter that was circulated in the uh, House at the close of the baseball season, and the chairman and I are both the uh, great aficionados of that great game. In fact, I think he is now prepared to uh, admit that the 1998 Yankees were the equal of the 1976 Reds. And in that statement it said, it quoted some professor of statistics from a place I do not recall, that uh, if we had used sampling, that Sammy Sosa would have had 66 home runs and Mark McGuire 65. In the 1990 census, Mark McGuire had 70 home runs and Sammy Sosa had zero. That is really the problem. We have to move towards the best possible design that we can construct. And it is possible to take any design and to look at its various characters and its flaws and the aspects of its implementation and to dwell on it. But the question is, is there a superior alternative? 
And it's my hope that our board will stay focused on that question as to whether or not there is another way to get rid of a pernicious and systemic undercount in the census historically, a concern that's shared throughout this board, whether or not there is an alternative, a superior alternative, and if there is, then let's find out about it very quickly. I don't see that yet. But with that said, the search will continue. And the search will move, we're going on the road, to uh, Sacramento, California on the morning Pacific Standard Time of December 16th. And for those of you who want to tune in for the next episode of Science on Trial, <laughs> we will look forward to seeing you there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, brother. All right. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Just to head on C-SPAN 2, President of the John Birch Society, John McManus, talks about international issues in this century and how they relate to the United States and the world. Join us tomorrow morning live at 7 Eastern on our companion network, C-SPAN, for Washington Journal. Our guest is Christian Science Monitor Editor David Cook. He'll discuss the newspaper's 90th birthday. And Thanksgiving Day, this Thursday, our companion network, C-SPAN, will show you the annual state opening of the British Parliament, including the Queen's Speech, which marks the start of the parliamentary session. That's Thanksgiving Day at 1 p.m. and 5.35 Eastern on our companion network, C-SPAN. Next from Dedham, Massachusetts, John McManus, the president of the John Birch Society. He spoke this summer at the Endicott Estate about various international issues in this century and how they relate to the United States and its role in the world. His speech is around an hour and 50 minutes. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and we welcome you to, you to this affair this evening. Uh, we thank you all for coming. My name is Ward Rowley from New Hampshire. I'm a member of the National Council of the John Birch Society. As is customary, we always start our meetings with a prayer and a salute to the flag. So I'd like to call on Father Philip Stark to lead us in a prayer, please. As you know, at the first Pentecost, the great event was the outpouring of the Holy Ghost upon the infant Christian community outpouring and downpouring are not very pleasant words, I suppose, in light of the weather we've been having. But we can hardly do better than to invoke the aid of the Holy Ghost in the words of the familiar prayer, Come, Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, who didst instruct the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that by the same Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Father. If you remain standing for a pledge to the flag, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and, and to, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.
I just might like to quickly mention that we do have a book table right up there. I think most of you may have seen it. I particularly draw to your attention a, a few books, Changing Commands by John F. McManus, Financial Terrorism by John F. McManus, Shadows of Power. Also, uh, please take a look at the New American magazines that are up there. I think Hal has a good supply of the conspiracy issue, which is the most informative issue I've ever read. The John Birch Society was founded in 1958 as a nonpartisan education and action organization. We believe strongly in the American system given us by our founding fathers, and we oppose just as strongly all attempts to subvert it and to bring our nation into a tyrannical new world order. Our goal is to share information with the American people believing that a well-informed public is an essential ingredient of freedom. We invite men and women of good conscience and human ideals of all races, colors, creeds, and national origin to join with us to bring about less government, more responsibility, and with God's help, a better world. Our speaker this evening was named president of the John Birch Society in 1991. He is a graduate of Holy Cross College in Massachusetts, a former Marine Corps officer and electronics engineer, a close associate of our late founder, Robert Welch, an author of several books, a radio and television spokesman, and a widely sought after speaker. His presentation this evening has been hailed by audiences from coast to coast as the clearest explanation of contemporary events available today. His title is An Overview of Our World. With great pleasure, I present my good friend, John F. McManus. Thank you, Ward, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's a delight to be with you. We always try to start off a program, no matter how short or how long, with a little bit of levity. I like to tell a story about the fellow who was mountain climbing, and he was walking along a ridge, and he stumbled and tumbled down, and he was about to fall into a great big cavern or something at the bottom when he grabbed onto a branch, and he was holding it and holding on for dear life. And he caught his breath and he yelled, is, is anybody up there? And nothing happened. And, and then he turned and again he said, is, is anybody up there? And a voice came back down to him and said, yes, I'm here. Let go of the branch. And he said, is anybody else up there? <laughs> that's a little bit the way we are in America today. We have leaders of our country who are up there and we're wondering if there's anybody else up there. Now, it's our purpose here this evening to go over some basics and then to get into some of the specifics of what is happening on a contemporary basis. We start off by defining what our country is and what we in the John Birch Society are in favor of. And it's very simple. We're in favor of Americanism. Amen. And it has a definition. The definition of Americanism isn't something that we put together. It's not something that uh, the John Birch Society dreamed up. The definition of Americanism is in the birth certificate of our nation, the Declaration of Independence. And it's there you find that phrase that says, men are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Now stop right there. That's the fundamental premise upon which this nation is built. There is a God, and he gave us our rights. And then in the very next breath in that declaration, they defined the proper role of government. They said to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the government. And there is the entire philosophical basis of the United States of America. There is a God. He gave us our rights. We use our rights and powers to form a government for the express purpose of protecting those rights and nothing more. 
not to redistribute the wealth, not to take control of people's lives, not to dominate their very existence, simply to protect their God-given rights. That's Americanism. Now, sometimes people say, well, okay, fine, that's wonderful, but what are you concerned about in the John Birch Society? Well, one concern I have is you can't teach that in the government schools. If you can't posit that God exists, how can you teach that rights come from God? And so you go from one end of this country to the other, and you ask people, wherever you meet them, where do you get your rights? If you get anybody who says his rights came from God Almighty, consider yourself fortunate and realize that those people are an exception, not the rule. Most Americans, if you ask them where their rights came from, they'd shuffle a little bit and they'd say, well, I don't know, I guess uh, uh, the government or the Constitution or, or something. No, no, the very fundamental premise of our nation. I like to refer to it as the thunderous assertion. Men are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Now, uh, the, the nation, of course, began, and the British didn't care for that, and so there was a little war. We know about it. We, we call it the War for Independence. And uh, after the war was over, we won the war. We sent the British packing, and we had fought the war first under the Continental Congress and then under the Articles of Confederation. And after the war had finally been won, it was, in fact, 11 years later, they got together in Philadelphia to revise the Articles of Confederation. That was their uh, commission. That's what they were told to do. They exceeded their commission. They went beyond that. They scrapped the Articles of Confederation, and they came out with a whole new governmental system called the Constitution of the United States of America. And that's in this little booklet. And there's the Constitution. You can see how few pages it is. I like to say if it had been written by government today, it'd be that high off the floor, right? This little booklet has first the Declaration of Independence, the first five pages, and then the Constitution of the United States. So the Constitution of the United States was put together in Philadelphia in 1787. Whom does it limit? Does it limit you and me? No. No, it limits government, doesn't it? Strictly defined powers of government are given. Then they're separated. Then they're diffused. There's all kinds of guardians uh, against somebody becoming more powerful than he should. And so we see the Constitution of the United States then not rammed down the throats of the people at the time, but it went to the states for ratification. And one after another, the states ratified the Constitution and the Constitution took effect. In fact, it took effect after the ninth state, New Hampshire, ratified it. And that was on June 21st of 1788. If you go down to little Delaware, a little bit south of where we are here tonight, you see on the number plates in all the automobiles, it says the first state. And sometimes people say, well, where do they get off calling themselves the first state? Aren't there 13 original states? Well, the first state, Delaware was the first state to ratify the Constitution, and they are justly called the first. They beat Pennsylvania by five days, and I, I'm told Pennsylvania has never forgiven them. Right? <laughs> so the, the Constitution was ratified. Now, when, when it went through the states, the people, uh, some of them said, you know, it's nice, and we like it, and we're in favor of it, but it would probably be better if we added to it a statement of what we believed our rights to be. And so there was a, a, a kind of a pact was made. And the pact was, get the Constitution ratified, and after it's ratified, we'll add to it a statement of what we believe those rights to be, or at least the major ones. Now, those were amazing days. The politicians kept their promise. And so there was added to it a Bill of Rights. Now, you all know what the Bill of Rights is. Everybody knows the Bill of Rights. You know, freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of assembly, right to keep and bear arms, freedom from search and seizure, and so forth. But I go from one end of the country to the other, and people keep telling me about their First Amendment rights and their Second Amendment rights. And, and that's not really the way to, to phrase it. What you've got is a God-given right protected by the First Amendment, a God-given right protected by the Second Amendment, and so forth. Because the Bill of Rights gives us nothing but protection. And the phraseology, of course, is, is very clear. Congress shall make no law regarding this one, and this one, and this one, and this one. 
And I love to say all the way up to the marvelous Tenth Amendment that says if we forgot anything, you can't do that either. Right? Right? That's the American system. So don't ever refer to your First Amendment or your Second Amendment rights anymore. From now on, it's your rights protected by the First, protected by the Second, and so on. And so the Bill of Rights was added, the Constitution limited government, and the United States of America took off. Limited government will always mean prosperity. Now, I want to define this a little more deeply, and I brought along my charts, and I've, we've, we've passed out copies of these charts, so you each have one. And we're going to first talk about political systems, and then we'll talk about economic systems, the same kind of an analysis. Now, if you can see my chart, you see I've got five listed here, five different political systems. Monarchy or dictatorship is ruled by one. Oligarchy ruled by an elite or a few. Democracy ruled by majority. Republic ruled by law. Anarchy ruled by no one. And I think all possible systems are represented here except theocracy. And if God's going to come down and set up a government, then there's no sense us even bothering talking about this anyway. So, but, so we're not going to get into theocracy. But these are the man-made systems. Let's analyze them. I think we can narrow it down to fewer than the five. We start off by saying that monarchy or dictatorship ruled by one doesn't exist in the practical sense. It's never ruled by one, it's ruled by a group. They've put one up amongst, the, uh, uh, one amongst them up front and said, you be the public relations man for the group or the leader of the group and so forth. And it's never really ruled by one, it's ruled by a group. The kings have their councils of nobles and earls, the, the dictators have the politburos or whatever they call them. And it's always a group. So we're not gonna focus on rule by one, we'll cross that off in fact, and we jump right over to rule by the group. Oligarchy, ruled by an elite, a group, a few, and that happens to be the most common form of government in all history. It's also the most common form of government today. Most of the nations of the world are ruled today by a powerful few, and unfortunately, it's what our country is becoming. Not much more needs to be said about that. So you see, we've outlined that. That's going to stay. We're not going to cross off oligarchy. It's very common and it's something to be feared. Now let's jump down to the other end here. Now we talk about anarchy for a few minutes. Anarchy means no government. And there are some people who, looking over world history, have said that some of the worst crimes in history have been perpetrated by governments. And so they say maybe the best thing to do would be have no government at all. And that's wrong. I disagree completely. If we're going to live in society, we have to have rules, and that means government. It's how many rules you have and whether or not the rules guard against somebody taking control is also a, pro a part of the problem. And so anarchy turns out not to be something that somebody wants for the duration. We see all kinds of examples in history of people working towards anarchy, breaking down the existing system, not because they want no government, but because they want to get rid of what they have. Anarchy turns out to be a very useful way of inserting yourself in power. And it has happened over and over again in the 20th century. It happened in Russia in 1917. It happened in, uh, in Germany in the 20s. It happened in China in the 40s. Anarchy means uh, a vacuum. It's, it's like there's nothing. And something rushes in to fill it. Now, when you say anarchy, you usually mean chaos, looting, burning, killing, terror. And when that happens, good people will usually go to the person best able to put an end to the anarchy and ask him, please, take over, restore order. Who's best able to put an end to the anarchy? Those who started it. Those who brought it about. And isn't that what has happened throughout history? It's certainly a good example of that is what happened in Germany in the 20s. And so anarchy becomes a transition between what you have and what somebody else wants. But it's not a stable form of government. It's a speedy transition from possibly freedom to tyranny. So we're gonna cross that off as well. Realize that it may happen and you may find yourself in that condition, but not for very long. Now we've crossed off rule by one, we've crossed off rule by none, we've said rule by the few, the oligarchy, is very common 
and very common today, not only today, but all throughout history. And now we're down to democracy and republic. And most of the people in our country have been persuaded that we're a democracy and we've never been anything else but a democracy. And yet when we pledge allegiance to the flag, we pledge to the republic for which it stands. I don't know anybody who's sung the battle hymn of the democracy lately either. Right? <laughs> so are we a democracy or a republic or does it really matter? Is this just a semantic argument? And let me assure you, my friends, it is not a semantic argument. The difference between a democracy and a republic is fundamental to understanding what this country is all about. So let's get into it. Democracy. Uh, one good way of analyzing what these words mean is to go back to their root meanings. We go back to the Greek language for demos and kratian. Demos, people, kratian to rule, the people to rule. And when more people want something than don't, the majority rules. And again, you say that to a lot of Americans, they nod their head and they say, that's fine, that's what we want, majority rule, that's good, let's, let's have it. And I'll say to them, uh, suppose the majority decides to take away your home. Well, no, that's, that's not right. Suppose the majority decides to take away your children. Uh, they begin to see that there's a flaw in majority rule. Uh, if I came to one of you and I said, I'm about to take away your home because the majority behind me says it's okay to do so, you might stand up and you'll say, no, you're not gonna do that. I have my rights protected by the Constitution of the United States of America. And if you said that, you would be describing a republic. So what then is a republic? Well, that word comes from the Latin, res publica, res thing, publica, public, the public thing, the law. And a true republic is one that starts off by recognizing that individuals have rights and therefore the limitation in the law is mostly upon the government. And the people are left alone. That's a huge difference. Our founding fathers were very explicit about giving us a republic and not a democracy. And the reason that they were was that they, they had studied what had happened in ancient Greece and in ancient Rome, and they knew that the democracies in Greece ended up in tyranny and that the republic in Rome spawned prosperity. So there were democracies, pure democracies existed in the Greek city-states in the time before Christ. And they actually herded the people of the community into an arena and they had the impassioned oratory from one side and then the other, and these were the teachers of the people, that word is demagogue. The one who swayed the mob, carried the day, and they had some of the wildest excesses of government on record. In every case, the Greek city-states ended up in tyranny. There was a man in Greece at the time named Solon. His word has come down to our language as a common noun. It means lawyer, lawgiver, Solon, S-O-L-O-N. And Solon looked over that situation, he said, you know, it'd be better if we had a fixed body of law that nobody could violate, especially the government. And he was on to something, wasn't he? Right? But the Greeks didn't adopt it. About that same time, some people from Rome took a trip over to Greece to find out what was happening there, and they, they discovered Solon's principles. They brought them back to Rome, they incorporated them into their own government as the 12 tables of the Roman law. They built a republic. One of my old friends used to say, they carved it in stone and they didn't give anybody else a chisel, right? <laughs> so they built a republic. And true to what a republic was supposed to be, the limitation was upon government, not upon the people. Now, if you limit government, the people are free. And what do free people do? They work harder, they produce more for a very simple economic reason, and that is that they're able to keep the fruits of their labor. Nobody has ever come up with a better incentive to produce than that people be able to keep the fruits of their labor. And so because government was limited to its proper role at the beginning of the Roman Republic, the people were free, they produced. And the standard of living went up and personal uh, wealth went up and, and Rome reached out to all the world at the time and uh, prosperity reigned. It wasn't too long, however, in Rome that even the Romans forgot what freedom was. If you remember anything else I say tonight, please remember this. The essence of freedom is the limitation of government. The Romans forgot. The first incursion into their freedom was when they started agriculture supports. And some of the people went to the Roman 
tribunes and senators and say, well, where are you getting the authority to do this? It's not in the, the, the Roman law. And the response was, well, certainly you want us to, to help stimulate the growth of food. You know? Never mind the law, you know, just don't even answer the question, go around it. Well, then they had welfare programs, and then they had all kinds of other programs, and pretty soon, in order to pay for all these programs, the taxation went up, the controls went up, the regulations went up, and pretty soon, prosperity went down, and then hunger started reigning. Anybody who knows anything about ancient Rome knows that the mobs roamed the streets, screaming for more bread and more circuses. What had happened is the republic had been converted into a democracy, and the democracy degenerated into anarchy as the mobs roamed the streets, and finally the whole thing came crashing down upon them. And they ended up right here in oligarchy, a progression of the Caesars, where the Caesars had total power and where they ruled with the iron fist. That's history, ladies and gentlemen. That has happened. And that history is what prompted our founding fathers to give us a republic and not a democracy. And they were extremely explicit about it. James Madison, for instance, is the uh, first, uh, he's the father of the Constitution. He's one of the authors of the Federalist Papers. And he was, of course, the fourth president of the United States. It's his notes that helped us to understand so much of what went on at the Constitutional Convention. But in Federalist paper explaining the Constitution for the farmers in New York State, Madison gave his opinion of democracy. Now realize that most of the people in our country right now are persuaded that we're a democracy. And we've never been anything else but. Madison said, hence it is that such democracies have ever been spectacles of turbulence and contention, have ever been found incompatible with personal security or the rights of property, and have in general been as short in their lives as they have been violent in their deaths. He wanted nothing to do with democracy. In fact, it is true that you will not find the word democracy in the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, and I believe it's still true, not in any of the constitutions of any of the 50 states. The word just does not appear. So they gave us a republic. At the Constitutional Convention, after they had finally put it together, Benjamin Franklin came out on the sidewalk and a woman met him and said, Sir, what have you given us? And he said, A republic, ma'am, if you can keep it. If you can keep it. Very, very important point. So let's conclude something here. Let's conclude that democracy itself is not a stable form of government. It's a slow transition from freedom to tyranny, anarchy being the speedy transition. You may find yourself living in democracy at some time, and you can begin to make a case today that we do live in a democracy as our own leaders vote majority rule uh, to the exclusion of the Constitution of the United States, and they do it over and over and over again. Well, if we've crossed off this and this and this, that leaves us just two. And you see, we've outlined two. Ultimately, there are two forms of government. A republic, rule of law, or an oligarchy, the rule of man. Which do you prefer? Well, obviously, you prefer the rule of law when the law limits the government. There are some governments that call themselves republics, like the People's Republic of China. They are no, not limited at all, nor was the uh, Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. It's a communist lie to use that word as, as they do use it. This is what our founding fathers gave us. And this is the way we're heading. And we used to talk about creeping towards it. Now it seems to be almost a hundred yard dash. Right. Now, we mentioned the Bill of Rights. And I want to go over something here, and I want to show the distinction that, that should be known by all Americans between this and the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, or International Covenant on Human Rights. We see here it says, Congress shall make no law. All right? And I, that can't be more plain, I guess. In other words, regarding the rights that all of us get from God Almighty, they are not a federal matter. Congress has no authority to make a law regarding religion, regarding speech, press, assembly, petition government, 
keep and bear arms, and so on. All right? and, and, and we can't pound that in enough. All right? Now we go to the United Nations. And I have here the International Covenant on, on Human Rights. There are two of them in this book. I got this from the United Nations. We get over to uh, page 13 now. We're talking about the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which is the equivalent for the UN of the Bill of Rights of the US Constitution. All right, now let's start off by asking, does the United Nations recognize that rights come from God? Well, the United Nations doesn't even recognize God. <laughs> so, so they don't recognize that rights come from God. Uh, you may find in some United Nations documents that rights exist just as a part of the person or, or something. But generally, what they want you to believe is that you have rights that were given you by the United Nations. Now, it's true that if somebody gives you something, you can take it away, can't you? Okay, now, remembering Congress shall make no law, we read, for instance, Article 18 of this International Covenant from the United Nations. Everyone shall have the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. That sounds good. Where did it come from? They don't say. Two sentences later, here's what they say. Freedom to manifest one's religion or beliefs may be subject only to such limitations as are prescribed by law. Do you see it? And they do it over and over again. Everyone shall have the right to freedom of expression. It may therefore be subject to certain restrictions, but these shall only be such as are provided by law and are necessary. What a difference between Congress shall make no law. And this is just one reason why our nation should get out of the United Nations. Now, one other point I want to make here before we shift, and that is I want to talk about the U.S. Army training manual. I have here a couple of pages from a training manual that was put together in 1928. And it was at a time when our nation wasn't at war, and it was civics training for the troops while they were in service. It's a good idea. And they defined the different forms of government. I want to read to you what they said about democracy because it's right on target. It's wonderful. It says, democracy, a government of the masses, authority derived through mass meeting or any other form of direct expression results in mobocracy. Attitude toward property is communistic, negating property rights. See, that's if the majority can say, we want your property, then bingo, you go and get it. Right? Attitude toward the law is that the will of the majority shall regulate, whether it be based on deliberation or governed by passion, prejudice, or in, results in demagogism, license, agitation, discontent, and anarchy. They made the very same point I made. 1928. Well, that was superseded. Eventually, we came down to a 1952 booklet called The Soldier's Guide. And it did the same thing. Here's what it said meaning of democracy. Because the United States is a democracy, the majority of our people decide how our government shall be organized and run. Ladies and gentlemen, that is false in every aspect of it. We are not a democracy, and our government is not decided, we don't decide how our government shall be run by, by democracy, by, by the people. The decision has already been made, and the decision is the Constitution of the United States of America, which, if it were fully enforced, would see the federal government 20% the size and 20% the cost. And wouldn't that be wonderful? Well, ultimately, two forms of government. The republic ruled by law, which is what our founding fathers gave us, an oligarchy ruled by man, which is the way we're heading, as we go from here to democracy and on to oligarchy. Now let's shift gears here a little bit. Now we'll do the same kind of an analysis of economic systems. We'll talk about what our founders gave us and what we're getting instead today. We've been told for many, many years that there's a great war going on economically between communists and capitalists. And that's supposed to be the two competing forces. And yet, if you go to a decent dictionary and you try to define capital, you find that capital is the means of production. If it's the means of production, then you're talking about tools, machinery, 
equipment, even your bare hands. And if that's so, then everybody's a capitalist. Everybody uses tools or machinery or their bare hands to produce. And so everybody's a capitalist. Well, then what then is the distinction that should be? And the distinction that should be is who owns, controls, and uses the capital, especially control, as we'll see. The difference between the two competing economic systems is monopolistic capitalism and competitive free enterprise. Let's analyze them. We start off by saying, here in the monopolistic state control system, the capital is owned privately or by the state, but it's controlled by the state. Over here, the capital is owned privately and controlled privately. That's the competitive free enterprise system. And so the distinction ultimately is not ownership as much as it is control. Sometimes you own something and somebody else controls it to his advantage. You might be better off if you didn't. I found that out years ago. I had a younger brother, I had an automobile. I was away in the Marine Corps. I let my younger brother have my automobile. I owned it, he controlled its use. Who was better off? <laughs> when I got back, I found out how much better off he was. <laughs> Let's go over it again. Here, the capital can be owned privately or by the state, but it's controlled by the state. Here, owned and controlled privately. Big difference. In a monopolistic state control system, what kind of prices are you going to get? You're going to get high prices, aren't you? They'll milk you. What kind of quality goods? Communist junk, right? We always knew that. Competitive free enterprise system, you get low price. You've got 15, 20 different producers vying with each other to get you to buy their product. So you get the lowest possible price and you get the highest quality. All right, you get high price, low quality here. You get low price, high quality there. Which do you choose? Well, obviously, if you're about your senses, you're going to pick the competitive free enterprise system, aren't you? Well, then who chooses a monopoly? The answer is very simple. A criminal. A criminal would choose a monopolistic system. And some of the worst criminals in all history are those who have seized control of governments and set themselves up as the dictators of everything that goes on, including everything in the economic realm as well. This is the Soviet Union. This is China. Uh, China, they tell us today, is becoming more and more capitalist. Well, is it monopoly capitalism or is it free enterprise capitalism? They don't tell us. They see, they don't make that distinction. Ultimately, the distinction between the two forms is private property, the full concept of private property. And private property has four elements. Ownership, control, use, and the ability to dispose of what you think you own. In fact, if you're not able to dispose of what you think you own, if the government comes along and says, no, you can't sell it to him, and you have to sell it to him at this price, you really don't own it in the full sense. The communist system has always made war on private property. Here, no private property in its full sense. Here, private property for all. Here, prosperity. Here, shortages and tyranny. Now, at the bottom of the chart, we've got four forms of state monopoly. These four forms of this. Fascism, Nazism, Socialism, and Communism. Let's discuss them each. Fascism, none of the capital was owned outright by the state, but it was all controlled. Mussolini's Italy, for instance. He came to the uh, Italian businessman and he said, look, I don't want to own your business. All I want to do is tell you what to produce and when to produce and how much to produce and who to hire and who to fire, where to buy your raw materials and what price to charge. The rest is up to you. <laughs> and he was a dictator and everybody knows that. But he didn't own the businesses, he just controlled everything. Then we jump to Nazism, which added ownership of a few of the large corporations in Germany. Nazi, of course, is the acronym for National Socialist. We'll come back to that point. Nazism, some of the capital was owned by the state, but it was all controlled, and they were dictators. The socialists, they say, really, if you want to control everybody and if you want to have total uh, domination, 
All you need to do is own the major industries, communications, transportation, the utilities, the water supplies, and so forth, and indeed you will control everyone else. Then you finally get to communism. All of the capital is owned by the state, all of it's controlled, and there's no pretenses. In a, in a way, in an eerie way, this is more honest than these other systems. And in another eerie way, fascism is more efficient. Because in a fascist system, a lot of people think, still think they own their business. Mm -hmm. And they worry about the uh, maintenance and upkeep on the machinery, and uh, they, they mow the lawns in front of the building, and they shovel the snow in the wintertime, and they make sure everything's nice, but the government controls them with bureaucracy, regulations, and all kinds of taxation, and so forth. And isn't that what we see happening in our country? Right. Now, we also want to make the point here that there is such a thing as a political spectrum. And we hear a lot about right wing and left wing and, and so forth. And, and these words are thrown around and there's never any definition as to what's the norm or, or what the, the, the middle is supposed to be. So let's, let's give the John Birch Society uh, uh, description of the political spectrum. Right? And it goes from zero government on one side to 100% government on the other. Now, the zero side, we've already talked about that. That's anarchy, isn't it? All right. And that's a dangerous thing. We don't want that. 100% government is any form of totalitarianism, and that would include fascism, Nazism, socialism, communism, princes, potentates, dictators, kings, ayatollahs, whatever. All right. And so we want neither of those. We want neither the extreme right, neither the extreme left. What do we want in the John Birch Society? We want the middle. We consider ourselves constitutional moderates, and of course most Americans have been told that we're, we're extreme right-wingers or something else. No, not at all. What we want is limited self-government. We want government limited by law, the Constitution, and we want the people limited by freely accepted moral codes like the Ten Commandments. And if you have that kind of a system, protect it, keep it, work hard to save it, because that's the best. The government limited by law and the people limited by freely accepted moral codes, the Ten Commandments. Now, we talk about the political spectrum as if it's a line from zero to 100%. It would be better to make it look like a horseshoe, bend it around. Because we've already talked about the fact that the jump from zero government, anarchy, to total government, tyranny, is a very short jump indeed. And there are people that work away from the middle down either side of it to get eventually to total government. Nazis and fascists are left wing, not right wing, if definitions mean anything. Everybody who says that they're right wing would admit that a socialist is a left winger, wouldn't he? And yet if you go to the Nazi acronym, you find it stands for National Socialists. And so how can those socialists be right-wing and these socialists be left-wing? It's more confusion, really. The political spectrum isn't hard to understand. And these adjectives of right-wing and left-wing and all these other wings are thrown around all the time, and it really is not a good idea to allow it to happen. Now, we talk about private property, and of course the ultimate in the destruction of private property comes with a document called the Communist Manifesto. Here we are in 1998, and it's the 150th anniversary of the writing of the Communist Manifesto by Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. And we've published this, and we want people to read it. We find it very, very helpful if people will read the Communist Manifesto. And if they do, they will find in the document a lot of very interesting quotations. I thought I had a card here. Well, I, I won't do it. They say in the Communist Manifesto, in this sense, the theory of the Communists may be summed up in a single sentence, abolition of private property. There it is, in its full sense, abolition of private property. They go on to talk about uh, denigrating the family. They do you, you want to charge us with wanting to stop exploitation of children by their parents to this crime? We plead guilty. They attack the family. They attack home education. They want to replace home education by social. They attack 
patriotism. They attacked uh, uh, countries and nationalities. And they even go on to say here that they abolish all truths, religion, morality, and act in contradiction to all past historical experience. It's all here. Now, one very interesting piece in the Communist Manifesto is they say that the first step in the revolution is to win the battle of democracy. Aha! The communists were in favor of democracy, and when they say win the battle of democracy, what they were saying is get the majority on their side, and then they get the majority to do whatever they wanted. So you don't find the word democracy in the Constitution of the United States, but you do find it in the Communist Manifesto. And then you get to the famous ten planks of the Communist Manifesto, and unfortunately, every single one of them is partially or fully in place in the United States and America today, and it all happened in the 20th century. What are we talking about? Well, abolition of property and land. Are there land controls? Boy, especially out west, the people are finding that. Heavy progressive income tax. We got it. Abolition of the rights of inheritance. We got it. Or at least partially. Uh, centralization of credit in the hands of the state by means of a national bank with state capital and an exclusive monopoly. That's the Federal Reserve System. The idea for it came from the Communist Manifesto. And we go on and on and on. Every one of them partially or fully in place in the United States of America today. And as I say, it all happened in the 20th century. The tenth of the planks in the Communist Manifesto is probably the most startling for most Americans. Free education for all children in public schools. Karl Marx wanted a government school system for obvious reasons. If the government controls the school system, then the government will decide what is taught and what is not taught. And haven't we seen that worked against us in America today? They threw God out of the schools. They threw prayer out of the schools. They threw the Bibles out of the schools. And sometimes people say to me, well, what is your solution to all of that? And my solution is very simple. Let the people who want prayer in the schools have theirs. Let the people who don't want prayer in the schools have theirs. And don't force anybody to pay for anybody else's idea of education. That's the American way. And if that were in, in place, we would see a proliferation of private schools and academies and church schools. We would see competition back in education, and competition always produces excellence. The opposite of competition produces what we're getting in America today. How bad is it in America today? Well, you know. You know that the government school system continues to decline in its quality and even now in its safety. And I heard a quip the other day, a fellow said a high school senior was asked a geography question. Somebody came to him and said, where's the English Channel? And he said, I don't know, we don't get cable. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you never have an economic system without a political system or vice versa. So let's combine the two. And let's see what we get. Let's put this one right up here for a, for a moment. All right, now, let's, let's cross them to begin with. How about a republic and limited government under the law and monopolistic state-controlled capitalism? Is that possible? No. No, that's a contradiction, isn't it? How about an oligarchy that allows competitive free enterprise? That's possible, but highly unlikely. All right? It can happen. You could have a benevolent dictator. You could have a kindly king, right? King St. Louis of France, for instance. Right? Uh, it's very, very unusual. And the good leader of the oligarchy could be slain tomorrow and somebody take his place and, and you've lost out. So ultimately, what you'll have is a republic, the rule of law, and competitive free enterprise, or an oligarchy, the rule of man, and monopolistic state control. This is what our founding fathers gave us. This is the way we're heading. And as I say, we used to talk about creeping socialism. It's not creeping anymore, my friends. It's, it's racing. Now, I want to make one other point, too. And the other point has to do with something that everybody knows exists, and yet hardly anybody knows what it is. And that's something called inflation. Inflation 
is generally thought to be, and of course is promoted to be, an, an increase in prices. In fact, you turn on your news, your television, you listen to the uh, business reports, and they'll say the, the rate of inflation is being held down, and what they're talking about is prices aren't rising. But is inflation rising prices? No, no. You go to a good dictionary. For instance, the Webster's 20th Century Unabridged, 1957, it says this, inflation, an increase in the amount of currency in circulation resulting in a relatively sharp and sudden fall in its value and rise in prices. In other words, the rise in prices is the effect of inflation. It is not inflation itself. One of my friends once said, people who think that inflation is rising prices probably think that wet streets cause rain. <laughs> no, they don't. Right? Inflation is an increase in the quantity of the currency. All currency, therefore, becomes less valuable. And because it does, merchants and, and businessmen ask for more of that in return for their goods and services. And what you think is a rising price is not. It's a lowering of the value of the currency. Now, suppose you had some money and you put it in a mattress, right? And uh, 20 years ago and 20 years down the road, you, you take your money out of the mattress and you'll find that it'll buy about 50%, maybe even 40% of what it would have bought had you spent it back then. Your money has lost value. Where did that value go? It was stolen from you by a process called inflation. Now that's been known to some. In fact, John Maynard Keynes was a famous British socialist he came to the United States at the request of uh, Franklin Roosevelt back in the 1930s to redesign America's economic system. He's the father of the attitude that says you can spend yourself into prosperity. That's kind of absurd, isn't it, right? I know there are people today who have a lot of credit cards and think that that's the way to go, but you don't spend yourself into prosperity. But this man Keynes wrote a book in 1920 called The Economic Consequences of the Peace. Now here's what he said, by a continuous process of inflation, governments can confiscate secretly and unobserved an important part of the wealth of their citizens. By this method, they not only confiscate, they confiscate arbitrarily. And while the process impoverishes many, it actually enriches some, those who are in on the deal. See? The process engages all of the hidden forces of economic law on the side of destruction and does it in a manner that not one man in a million can diagnose, so said Keynes. It's not true anymore. It used to be true. There's far more than a million can diagnose it because we've been telling a lot of Americans what it really is. In fact, I wrote a book on the subject called Financial Terrorism, and there are two chapters in here about inflation. Inflation stealing the people's wealth and inflation a destroyer of nations. And so we recommend that kind of perspective. If you understand what inflation is, then you understand that you're being told half-truths and mistruths and downright lies day after day after day by the economic reporters, the advisors, the big newspapers, the radio and television and so forth. Now let's, let's bring it down. I can remember as a boy, I'm pretty much telling you how old I am at this point. I remember as a boy, my mother sent me to the store to buy a loaf of bread and she gave me a dime to do it. I brought home the bread. My wife sent me out to buy a loaf of bread recently. It cost $2.10. <laughs> and you know what? The bread costs the same. The value of the money has changed. Where did that value go? It was stolen by a process called inflation. And the process today is being worked on us by the Federal Reserve. That's the fifth plank of the Communist Manifesto. And what has happened is that the federal government has given power to the Federal Reserve System that it didn't have in the first place. It has no power over the money system. If you go to the Constitution of the United States, it's pretty clear. Government should not have anything to say. The government had the power to coin money. 
What did that mean? Well, go to the founders. What did they mean by that? They tell you what they meant by it. What they meant by it was that the government would set up a mint and you could bring your gold and you could bring your silver and they would smash it into coins of a fixed weight and a fixed purity so that there would be a standard in our country. That's all. And they might charge you a little something to do that. That's fair. But that was what they were given the, po the, the power to do, to coin money, not to set up a bank, not to set up a money system at all. In no way. That's what was intended. And as long as we had gold, as long as we had silver behind our money, our country continued to grow and our country continued to prosper. We don't have that anymore. We are now at the mercy of the Federal Reserve System. They tell us how much money there will be in circulation, what its value will be. They tell us what the interest rates will be. They have control. They can create a boom. They can create a bust. And Karl Marx, in his grave, must be just smiling broadly because this is exactly what he wanted. It's exactly what we have. And sometimes I run into people who say, well, well if we don't have a Federal Reserve System, who's going to manage the money? Well, first of all, we didn't get it until 1913. We got along pretty well before that. Right? And secondly, you don't want anybody managing the money. There has never been honesty in the history of mankind with managed money. Money should manage itself. Let me give you another example. Back in Roman days, if you had a one ounce gold coin, you could take it to a merchant and you could get a nice toga, you could get a nice belt, and you can get a pair of sandals for that one ounce of gold. Now today, if you had a one ounce gold coin, you could buy a suit of clothes, and a belt, and a pair of shoes. The gold hasn't changed its value, has it? But that gold today commands $370, $380, I don't know, it's somewhere in that vicinity. Right? They used to call it a $20 gold piece that costs $380. $20, $380, how can that be? That gives you an idea of how the value of the currency has sunk. But the gold stayed the same price, didn't it? Right? We gotta get back to that. And if we get back to that, then we'll be really in better shape. Okay, so we talked about political systems, we talked about uh, economic systems, and we talked about the fact that, that our whole system of government is being changed. Let me go to my favorite sentence in the Constitution of the United States, and then we'll wind up the first part of this. Right after the preamble, my favorite sentence says, all legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States. All legislative powers herein granted in Congress. All right? Let's focus on the word all. <laughs> all right? You don't have to be an algebra scholar to know that all means all. <laughs> all, right? all right? If all legislative power is in Congress, how can a Supreme Court decision be the law of the land? And the answer is it can't, and it shouldn't be. What should it be? It should be the law of the case. It binds two parties, the plaintiff and the, and the defendant. That's all. Can a case be cited as a precedent in a similar case? Yes, that's proper. But what has the Supreme Court done? It has certified all kinds of intrusions into the people's sphere and it has actually created law itself. And it does it all the time. Most of the decisions of the Supreme Court should be it's none of the federal government's business and hand the whole matter back down to the states and the people themselves and, and stay out of it. All right, but they're constantly making law. All right, now, all lawmaking powers in Congress, what about an executive order that the president hands down that takes on the force of law simply by signing it and putting it in the federal register? Is that proper? Not if the Constitution is, is still in force, which it's still in, in type, but it's not still in force. So we see executive orders, we see presidential decision directives, we see all kinds of fiat from the president's office taking on the force of law, which it shouldn't do. And we're becoming more and more a centralized government. We're getting closer and closer to an oligarchy totally ruling us. All right, so 
My favorite sentence says, all legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in Congress. Let's now focus on herein granted. All right. What does that mean? That means any law that Congress makes that's proper is power that they have been given within these pages, herein granted. I defy anybody to find authorization here for foreign aid or for federal involvement in education, housing, welfare, medicine, transportation, energy, and on and on and on we go. As I said before, if, if in fact this was fully enforced, this Constitution, the federal government would be 20% its size and 20% its cost. Would that mean that people would be not cared for medically? No, it wouldn't mean that at all. They were cared for before. Would there be no schools? There'd be plenty of schools. Would there be transportation? Would there be all these other things that the government is involved in, costing billions and billions of dollars more than it should, and taking control of our lives? And that's what's really happening, right? So all legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in Congress. And you know, we can blame the president for taking powers away from Congress, or taking powers away from the people. We can blame the Supreme Court. We can blame Congress for allowing it to happen. Ultimately, we blame ourselves for allowing it to happen. John Birch Society is in business to wake the town and tell the people to tell you that you're losing your freedom and that you'd better get involved in helping to save it. The Constitution still stands. They do take an oath to it. Even if they then put it in the bottom drawer, we can make them abide by it if we have the will to do so. Right, now, who's doing all this to us? Who's, who's get us thinking that, that we're a democracy and not a republic? Who's got us thinking that, that capitalism and communism are the different economic systems when they're not? Who's got us thinking all these? The people who want an oligarchy. The people who want to rule us. And they're doing it secretly, and they're doing it with deception. They're doing it with all kinds of trickery. And, and all of what I've said can be boiled down to a single word. The single word is conspiracy. Now we're going to talk about the conspiracy. And we brought along some more charts, too. So let me take a second here, and I'll put up another chart. <clears throat> As you can see on this chart, we've got the elite, the insiders at the top. We've got the oligarchy. We said that it was an elite or a group. There it is. Now, we in the Birch Society call them the insiders. Uh, I have a little book that I wrote called The Insiders. I thought I had a copy of it here, but I don't. Little book that goes over who the insiders are from the Carter administration, then from the Reagan administration, then from the Bush administration, now from the Clinton administration. And the insiders of this conspiracy want not only our country, they want the world. They want to rule the world. And their organization to do that is the United Nations. All right, so we want very much to look into the United Nations. And when we do, we see that the United Nations was formed at a meeting in San Francisco, California in 1945. And the Secretary General of the founding conference was a man named Alger Hiss, who was later found to be a communist loyal to the Soviet Union, working in the State Department of the United States. There were, in fact, 17 others who had those same credentials. And we have them named in, in our books. The United Nations has always sought world government. There are a lot of people who say, well, the United Nations, it's, it's really only a debating forum. And it's, it's something that uh, really you shouldn't get that upset about because uh, people just go there and talk. No, that's not so. I have a chart at home that's four or five times the size of this chart. And it lists all of the United Nations agencies and all of the United Nations programs. And let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, there are dozens of them, and they impact your life. We'll be talking some more about these as we move on. But we want to know, where did the United Nations come from? Who was really behind it? Yes, there were communists behind it, but there were also internationalists. There were people who wanted world government. Now you see here we've got the US government. But it's dominated by a couple of organizations, a couple more than we've got be beyond these. 
These two organizations that we'll focus on are called the Council on Foreign Relations, CFR, or the Trilateral Commission. And you see we've abbreviated it here. We want to talk about these two organizations. And surprisingly enough, even though the Council on Foreign Relations began in 1921 in our country, we're going to go back a few years before that and show you its roots, where it came from, how it generated. Now, one of the first things that we talk about is an amazing quotation was given by Mr. Bill Clinton in 1992 when he accepted the Democrat nomination for president on July 16th of 1992. He's now going to be the nominee. Of course, he won the election, as we know. In the middle of his speech, he said, as a teenager, I heard John Kennedy summons to citizenship. And then, as a student, I heard that call clarified by a professor I had named Carol Quigley. Now, when he said Carol Quigley, every member of the John Birch Society from coast to coast said, wait, wait a minute, right? And I'm sure most of the people in the United States said, isn't that nice? He's paying tribute to one of his professors. Right? So what is it about Quigley? Well, I'm going to put a stack of books up here, and, and we're going to be referring to them. The first one is the book by Carol Quigley. The first book here is Tragedy and Hope, A History of the World in Our Time, written by Professor Carol Quigley, who was at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. Bill Clinton, of course, is a graduate of Georgetown University. During the period that Bill was there, this book came out. It was 1966. And you can see it's 1,350 pages. I get a sore back carrying it around. That's Carol Quigley's revenge, I guess you could say. <laughs> All right, what did he say in this book? Well, he said many, many things. He talked about a professor named John Ruskin who came to Oxford University in England in 1870 and took the campus by storm. He was an amazing individual. He, he uh, captivated the students. And he talked to them about the fact that they were the elite. They were the people who should run the world. And he especially pointed out that the English-speaking people should dominate mankind. And of those, the ones who should do it the most were the ones who were going to Oxford University. Right? And so he captivated his students. And the one student who probably was captivated more than anyone was a man named Cecil Rhodes. Cecil Rhodes later, of course, became one of the wealthiest persons that the world has ever known. After Ruskin's lectures and Rhodes starting to carry out the designs of, Cecil, of uh, John Ruskin, they formed an association. And Quigley talks about all of this. Now, I should mention at the start here that Quigley constantly refers to the creation of a secret society to rule the world but he never calls it a conspiracy. He didn't call it a conspiracy, honestly, because he didn't think it was evil. A conspiracy has three elements, secrecy, more than one person, and evil. If you don't believe it's evil, you don't use the word conspiracy. You just talk about a secret society. And so that's what Quigley talked about. And Quigley's book became very, very famous amongst people like the John Burt Society. So much so that after the first printing was exhausted, the publisher would not publish again. Okay. Quigley was wild. Why aren't you publishing my book? Well, I don't think they ever told him that most of the copies were being bought up by members of the Birch Society. They'd gone to libraries and, and colleges and so forth. All right, so let me read some of the quotes from Quigley's book. This association, he says, was formally established on February 1st, 1891, when Rhodes and Stead, a man named Stead, organized a secret society of which Rhodes had been dreaming for 16 years. He goes on and says, in 1919, they founded the Royal Institute for International Affairs in England. Similar institutes of international affairs were established in the chief British dominions and in the United States where it is known as the Council on Foreign Relations. Right? Quigley's telling tales out of school. 
But he's a historian, and he's just praising this thing. He eventually said, I think it's a wonderful idea. I've studied it for many years and was permitted for a couple of years to examine its papers and secret records. And, and the only disagreement I have with it is that it wants to remain secret. I think it should be well known. And so he wrote his book. Right? His book has proved very valuable to us who knew of the existence of all these things. And here we have corroboration pretty much from the inside. Now, did he ever get around to actually spelling out what their goal was? Yes, he did. Carol Quigley tells us they had another far-reaching aim, and it was nothing less than to create a world system of financial control in private hands, able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole. Wow. <laughs> let, me, let me throw that at you again. All right? Nothing less than to create a world system of financial control in private hands, able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole. Well, ladies and gentlemen, they have largely accomplished much of that. Quigley not only wrote this book, he, he at the end of this book, he talked about the fact that what we want to make sure happens is that the two major parties are carrying out our agenda with different nuances, but our agenda, right? And that's been accomplished as well, right? Then Quigley wrote another book before he died. His book's called The Anglo-American Establishment. Part of the goal of these people initially was to cancel the Declaration of Independence, reunite America to Mother England, right? And I have some objections about that, right? Not just because I'm of Irish ancestry, although that enters into it, right? <laughs> I think the United States should not reunite with England. Right. So in this book, Carol Quigley talks about the legacy of Cecil Rhodes, the financial legacy. Cecil Rhodes left seven separate wills. The man was so wealthy. He had exploited the diamond mines and the, and the uh, gold mines in southern Africa and became one of the most fabulously wealthy persons who ever lived. Right. And so Quigley tells us, what did he do with some of his money? In the sixth and seventh wills, the secret society was not mentioned, and the scholarships monopolized the estate. What scholarships? The Rhodes scholarships. The scholarships, says Quigley, were merely a facade to conceal the secret society. Or more accurately, they were to be one of the instruments by which members of the secret society could carry out his purpose Part of which, of course, was the ultimate recovery of the British, by the British Empire of the United States of America. Right? That's what Quigley told us. So the Rhodes Scholarship Program was set up in order to promote and carry out the goals of the secret society to rule the world. Bill Clinton's a student at Georgetown University. Bill Clinton has a professor named Carol Quigley who introduces him to all of this. Bill Clinton aspires to and becomes a Rhodes Scholar. He comes back from Rhodes Scholar program, goes to law school at Yale. That's where he met Mrs. Clinton, Hillary. They went back to Arkansas. He got involved in politics. He aspired to and became a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. And then a member of the Trilateral Commission. And then a member of several other international bodies who helped to decide whether or not he's fit to be the president of the United States. Right. Do foreign people have some input? In yes, they do. The Bilderberger movement started by David Rockefeller and, and uh, Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands. So let's go back and talk now about the actual founding of the Council on Foreign Relations. In 1919, World War I had ended, and the men who had the responsibility of joining with the British and the French to put together a treaty at the end of the war, the Versailles Treaty, were meeting in Paris. Now, it had already been proposed that there be a world government called the League of Nations. The League of Nations was to be here where the United Nations is today. And here were these men over in France, Americans, and they were working with their English and French counterparts. They got word that the United States Senate 
had turned thumbs down, were not going to join the League of Nations. They were very, very upset. Right? And so, carrying out the designs of Rhodes and Ruskin and a lot of others, they decided now was the time to form the Council on Foreign Relations. So, the British formed the Royal Institute for International Affairs, the Americans formed the Council on Foreign Relations. It brought it back to the United States, incorporated it in 1921. It's headquartered in New York City, and its main goal is to promote world government. Now, we'll talk about that. Now, the chief delegate, the man who was in charge of the American negotiators at that Paris meeting, was a man named Edward Mandel House. And House was President Wilson's top advisor. Wilson thought, thought so highly of House that he said, he's my alter ego, my other self. He, he said he's the first man I see every morning, he's the last man I see every night before I go to bed. So who was this House? Well, House was a Texan. He's known as Colonel House, but he wasn't a military man. It's an honorary colonel title, somewhat like Kentucky Fried Chicken Colonel, I guess. <laughs> House was an internationalist and a socialist. In fact, House had written a book in 1912 called Philip Drew Administrator, talking about a military takeover of the United States and the imposition of total government. Now, he didn't even put his name on the book, but he later admitted, yes, it was he who had authored it. He was the most powerful man in our country for the eight long years of the Wilson administration. He actually had chosen Wilson to be president amongst the Democrats. He had promoted him and helped him into power. Now, what did he say in the book? In the book, he said he was working for, quote, socialism as dreamed of by Karl Marx, close quote. Okay. In the book, you'll find a call for a central bank, Karl Marx's fifth plank. We got it in 1913, the first year of the Wilson administration. He called for a, a federal income tax. We got it in 1913, the first year of the, in, of the administration of, of Woodrow Wilson. He called for abolishing the Constitution, called for reuniting England and the United States, carrying out the designs of John Ruskin and Cecil Rhodes. That's what this book is all about. Now, this is the man who was, if anyone, the founder for America of the Council on Foreign Relations. He had his young lieutenants with him, his, his young, eager diplomats, among whom we could find John Foster Dulles and Alan Dulles and Sumner Wells and Walter Lippmann, names that became very well known to my generation and even later. They were all founders of the Council on Foreign Relations. So what did the Council on Foreign Relations want? Well, House himself began to write articles for their magazine. The Council on Foreign Relations has a magazine it's called Foreign Affairs. In 1923, one of their issues came out, and here's an article by House. Here's what he said. If war had not come in 1914 in fierce and exaggerated form, the idea of an association of nations would probably have remained dormant for great reforms seldom materialize except during great upheavals. Right. Well, they didn't get what they wanted out of World War I. Did they start then planning to have another war? Yes, indeed, they did. I won't get into it, but yes, indeed, they did. In fact, in 1939, a delegation from the Council on Foreign Relations volunteered to run a department for the State Department of our country. They eventually took control of the whole State Department. And these individuals, wanting world government, always wanting world government, scrapped the Declaration, scrapped the Constitution, have had control of our State Department and a lot of other positions in government for decades. The Council on Foreign Relations began to get funding from the Rockefellers, the Carnegies, and so forth in the 20s. They began to move their people into government. By 1952, they're now running their own people for president, but not telling the American people that both of the major candidates are members of the Council on Foreign Relations. 1952 was General Eisenhower versus Adlai Stevenson, both members of the Council on Foreign Relations. Again in 56, the same two. And then in 60, John Kennedy versus Richard Nixon, both members of the Council on Foreign Relations. 
And with precious few exceptions, all through the years, almost all of the major candidates for President of the United States, the ones who got the nomination, have been members of the Council on Foreign Relations. Richard Nixon and Hubert Humphrey and then uh, Gerald Ford and Jimmy Carter and George Bush and, and Bill Clinton and, and so forth and Walter Mondale was the opposite and du Michael Dukakis was a candidate. All members of the Council on Foreign Relations. How many Americans know this? And the organization's goal? Push the United States into a world government. Now, during many, many years, the man who was the chairman of the Council on Foreign Relations was David Rockefeller. In 1970, a man named Zbigniew Brzezinski, who later became somewhat prominent in the Carter administration as a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, he wrote this book called Between Two Ages. The book is 1970. David Rockefeller is the head of the Council on Foreign Relations, friend of Brzezinski. What does Brzezinski recommend in his book? Well, he first of all praises Marxism for 60-odd pages. Then he says the United States is becoming obsolete. He said we need, finally, a movement toward a larger community of the developed nations through a variety of indirect ties and already developing limitations on national sovereignty. He specifically recommended piecemeal growth towards a world government. And the piecemeal growth that he recommended was an association of nations from Western Europe, North America, and Japan. Well, he just recommended the United States. They threw in Canada, they made it North America. That's the three areas became the Trilateral Commission. It was finally launched in 1973. Zbigniew Brzezinski became its executive director. David Rockefeller is its chairman. Its goal? piecemeal transition, mostly through the economic realm. The Council on Foreign Relations working mostly through the political realm. Although members from both, uh, they share common membership. Now, the Council on Foreign Relations today has about 3,300 members, all U.S. citizens. The Trilateral Commission only has 300 members, 100 from Western Europe, 100 from North America, that a few, a few from Canada, and 100 from Japan. Now you look down the list of who is in those organizations and you see it's amazing. I mean, these are the, the movers and shakers of our country. Council on Foreign Relations today. Bill Clinton's a member. Most of his cabinet officials are members. We. Uh, we go back to James Madison again for another quotation. James Madison at one point said, the very definition of tyranny is the accumulation of all powers, legislative, executive, and judicial in one single place. Okay? That's the very definition of tyranny according to James Madison. All right? Legislative, executive, and judicial. All right? Executive branch, the president's a member. All, almost all of his cabinet officers are members. Many of his ambassadors are members, and so forth. They have pretty tight control over the executive branch. What about the judicial branch? Well, we have nine justices of the Supreme Court, don't we? Three of the nine are members of the Council on Foreign Relations. Sandra Day O'Connor, Ruth Gader, Bader Ginsburg, and Judge William Breyer from Boston. Those three, all right? So they have a pretty good influence, we'll say. Not total control there. All right. Well, what about the legislative branch? Well, you go to the legislative branch and you find that the chief opponent, so-called, of President Clinton is the leader of the Republican Party in the House of Representatives, Mr. Newt Gingrich from Georgia. But he, too, is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. The Democrat who's the leader in the House is Richard Gephardt from Missouri. And he's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. There are about 15 congressmen. There are about 15 senators who are members of the Council on Foreign Relations. So go back to Madison. The definition of tyranny is the accumulation of all powers, legislative, executive, and judicial, in any single place. They're getting very close, aren't they? Right? And the American people are being deceived into thinking that they have leadership opposing the Clinton agenda in the person of Newt Gingrich and some of his Republican allies. Not so. 
of those who are in the Council on Foreign Relations in the House or the Senate, it doesn't matter if they're Democrat or Republican, and it doesn't matter to them. Right? Some of them are Republican, some of them are Democrat. They don't care. They have an agenda, and their agenda is world government subvert the United States. The Trilateral Commission formed in 1973. One of its first members, David Rockefeller and Brzezinski, went to Western Europe. They went to the United States. They went to Japan. They signed up people in this. One of the first members in the United States was a formerly obscure governor of a southern state named Jimmy Carter. And Jimmy Carter told us that he had no connections to the Washington scene, that he, that he was a, an outsider. And he even said that when he became president, he was going to turn the insiders out. Right. He said that. He didn't do it. Almost all of his cabinet members, including his vice president, Walter Mondale, were members of both the Trilateral Commission and the Council on Foreign Relations. And there's only about 90 Americans in the Trilateral Commission. But you go down and look at the list of who they are. It's amazing. It's a private organization in New York City, 68th Street and Park Avenue, right in the middle of Manhattan. Trilateral Commission's about 20 blocks away. It's on 47th Street. In fact, the Trilateral Commission is just, uh, it's in the shadow of the United Nations. I think when the sun is setting or when the sun is rising, the United Nations casts a shadow on it. Unfortunately, the United Nations casts a shadow on our whole country. All right, now, we want to talk about how are they going about what they want done, all right? And mostly what they're doing is they're, they're mounting a threat. They're mounting a great big threat. Uh, some of our founders were worried about things like that. I think it was Alexander Hamilton who said that there are many people who, in order to protect their liberty, in order to protect their security, would give up their liberty. Right. And I think we see that happening. And so you see here, I have four kinds, five kinds of threats that have been coming at us over and over and repeatedly. First threat was the USSR. Then we see debt, the environment, chemical biological warfare, and now China. China is getting ready. All right, so let's talk about these. Let's talk about the, 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 the potential threats. Uh, we go back to the Council on Foreign Relations and we see that in 1974, one of their chief writers very explicitly tells you what he's after. A man named Richard N. Gardner. And he wrote a book, he wrote an article called The Hard Road to World Order. And in it, he said what we need is an end run around national sovereignty, eroding it piece by piece. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that to me is abject treason. This man has been in and out of the State Department. He today is an ambassador to Spain, I believe. He's been a professor at Columbia University. And here he is talking about we want an end run around national sovereignty, eroding it piece by piece. He said this approach can produce some remarkable concessions of sovereignty that could not be achieved on an across-the-board basis. So what we have to do is the old bologna technique. You know, you take a bologna and you slice a piece off, you slice a piece, and you finally end up, you've got the whole thing. That's, that's what they're after. Richard Gardner was in the State Department when he and his mentor, a man named Harlan Cleveland, another member of the Council on Foreign Relations, produced a document that is absolutely stunning. When Americans find out about this, they just can't believe it. This is the U.S. program for general and complete disarmament in a peaceful world. It's called Freedom From War. It was presented to the United Nations in 1961 by John Kennedy, president. And he presented it as the fixed and determined policy of the government of the United States. The program has three large stages and steps to be taken within each stage many of which have already been accomplished. The program ends up by the United States turning over its military entirely to the United Nations. Now you say to yourself, do you mean to say, you John Birch Society man, do you mean to say that there are people within our government who were willing to turn over our military to the United Nations? I said, yes. 
Here it is, right here. 1961, a long program, carry out all the different, the, the nuclear test ban treaty is part of it. The treaty to ban the use of outer space for, for <coughs> nuclear weapons is part of it. The, the uh, different START treaties and other, you can read that into these things. But let me read to you the conclusion. Here I am on the last page. Progressive controlled disarmament would proceed to a point where no state would have the military power to challenge the progressively strengthened UN peace force. The UN would be all powerful. States would retain only those forces, non-nuclear armaments and establishments required for maintaining internal order. They would support and provide general power for the UN peace force. The manufacture of armaments would be prohibited. Right? Now that's not disarmament of nations only, that's also disarmament of the people. The manufacture of weapons would be prohibited except for those agreed types and quantities to be used by the UN Peace Force. UN Peace Force? Boy, if there ever was an oxymoron, Peace Force. Huh? Isn't, that, isn't that stunning? All right, so now, 1961 that was. They, they reissued the thing and expanded it, but it's the same program. They call it the outline, uh, the uh, blueprint for the peace race. And I personally called the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency just a couple of years ago, and I asked the head of it if this program is still in effect and it is still the policy of the United States. And the man who answered the telephone, who was the director of the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency, said, yes, indeed it is. And much of it has already been accomplished, and he was happy about that. I wasn't. Right. Now, that turned out to be a big year in 1961, because in 1961, this document was published. A world effectively controlled by the United Nations. Funded by the State Department, your, your money and mine, written by a MIT professor who was a member of the Council on Foreign Relations named Lincoln P. Bloomfield. And originally a classified document, and therefore its language is very blunt. There is no dancing around in this. Right. And what was the purpose of this? The purpose of this was to lay out what would have to be done in order to create a world effectively controlled by the United Nations. All right, so what did he say? Well, one of the things he said was, given a continuation unabated of communist dynamism, the subordination of states to a true world government appears impossible. Now think about that. This is 1961. And the subordination of states to a true world government doesn't seem possible because the United States is never going to get together with the Soviet Union. There's too much acrimony between them, which presents him with a dilemma. And so he says, but if the communist dynamic were greatly abated, the West might well lose whatever incentive it has for world government. In other words, if there's no communism scaring the American people, a lot of the American people won't go along with the idea of world government. Were a lot of our people going along with the idea of world government back in that period? Not only world government, but communist government. There were people saying better red than dead. What an alternative, huh? Better red than dead. There was a third alternative called victory, but nobody was allowed to talk about that. <laughs> If the communist dynamic were greatly abated, the West might well lose whatever incentive it has for world government. There's the whole program. Now, who was building up the Soviet Union so that they could aim missiles down our throats? The United States sent the technology, the equipment, the computers, the, the electronics, the money, everything. We sent everything. So bad, that by 1982, a, Congress, a, a senator from Colorado named William Armstrong made a speech before his fellows on the floor of the United States Senate. April 13th, 1982. Listen to what he said. He said, in the last 10 years alone, the United States and other Western nations have sold to the Soviet Union and its satellites more than $50 billion worth of sophisticated technical equipment the communists could not produce themselves. This equipment has been used to produce nuclear missiles, spy satellites, and air defense radars. 
In addition, the Soviets have been able to purchase entire factories designed and built by Western engineers and financed in large part by American and Western European banks. It is difficult to overstate the extent to which the West has contributed to the military threat that now endangers our very civilization. All right? Good for Senator Armstrong. Did it stop? No. Did the trade, the aid, the money, the equipment, did it continue? Yes. All during that period, the John Birch Society, all of our members everywhere, anybody else we could influence, passing out pamphlets, tracks, programs that we had. We used to have film strips, then we started videotapes. Anything we could do, magazines, books, showing people that what the Soviet Union had, they got from the United States of America. This whole thing was a sham. This whole thing was a very dangerous program leading to scaring us into wanting world government. Well, the Soviet Union imploded, didn't it? Right? And everybody is saying communism is dead. No. No, communism's not dead in China or in Cuba or in uh, North Korea or in Berkeley, California or in Cambridge, Massachusetts or a lot of other campuses, right? No, communism's not dead. And the threat that the Soviet Union posed could be brought right to the fore again tomorrow by Russia. They still have the nuclear weapons. They still have the missile capabilities. Right? But the idea of a threat, and that's what Senator Armstrong said, didn't he? He said, it is difficult to overstate the extent to which the West has contributed to the military threat that now endangers our very civilization. Well, what else did Lincoln P. Bloomfield say in his world effectively controlled by the United Nations. He said, unlike the conventional American view of the United Nations, membership in the new regime, far from being a privilege, would be mandatory. The overwhelming central fact would still be the loss of control of their military power by individual nations. Right. So he laid it all out. And it's an amazing document to read it. And again, I say it was originally classified. It became unclassified. We got a copy of it, paid for by your tax dollars and mine. And it's quite blunt in many, many places. So we use it to try and get people to understand what has happened. So we talk about the threat from the USSR, which is somewhat abated, but not necessarily gone. Right? What about a threat from debt? Could our nation be brought into world government because of indebtedness? There's all kinds of people who are recommending international currency, international banks, uh, subverting our economic life to a world consortium and so forth. That's what I wrote about in my book that I mentioned, Financial Terrorism. I've got quote after quote after quote from presidents, from secretaries of the treasury, from prominent economists prominent econ economists, you know. I love these people. I, I, don't know, I don't know why anybody pays them, some of these economists. Somebody said one time, if you took all of the economists at all these universities and you laid them end to end, that would be fine. <laughs> <laughs> Debt is a very important problem. Now, our country has an admitted debt of over $5 trillion. If you add to that obligations into the future that they have already on the books, but they have no money to pay for it, you're up to 17, 18, maybe 20 trillion dollars. That's more money than exists, right? Could, could that bring down our country? Yes, it certainly could. And now they tell us that now they're running surpluses. No, they're not. They're still taking all of the money that goes supposed to go into the Social Security system and so forth. They're still taking that as general revenue, and they always have. There's no such thing as a Social Security trust fund, and there never has been. Supreme Court decision, 1937, said all revenue from Social Security is general revenue. It's not ever been a trust fund. But debt is a very, very important threat to hold over us. They should be paying off the national debt. 
They should not be throwing money away in foreign aid. They ought to cancel it all tomorrow. It's all unconstitutional to begin with. Now, I said 1961 was a big year, and it certainly was, because in 1961, a group of individuals started meeting at a place called Iron Mountain in New York State. And at Iron Mountain, the purpose was to come up with an alternative to war to control the people. Come up with an alternative to war to control the people. They met over a period of three years, 1961 to 1963. And finally, their report was published. And it was published anonymously. The report from Iron Mountain. All right, now what did they finally come up with? What did they say would be a good thing to use to control the people? A credible threat, in other words. Here's what they said. It may be, for instance, that gross pollution of the environment can eventually replace the possibility of mass destruction by nuclear weapons as the principal apparent threat to the survival of the species. There you have it. They even said apparent. It may be, for instance, that gross pollution of the environment can eventually replace the possibility of mass destruction by nuclear weapons as the principal apparent threat to the survival of the species. Report from Iron Mountain. And they went on two paragraphs after making that statement and said this. A program of deliberate environmental poisoning could be implemented in a politically acceptable manner. They would even be willing to poison the environment in order to scare people into willingness to accept world government. So what are the environmental threats that have been generated? Global warming, ozone holes, acid rain, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and so forth. If you go to a competent scientist, he'll tell you the global warming is a myth. It doesn't exist. They started putting up satellites to check temperatures around the world in 1980. They now have 18 years of data. Prior to that, they had almost 100 years of data for thousands and thousands of stations all around the world. The data is all available, and the data, if you look at it, shows no warming, no cooling. You might have a warmer summer occasionally, you might have a colder winter, or you might have a warmer winter and a cooler summer. But if you average it out to only five years' time, you see there is no change. But they say that global warming is a condition that transcends national borders, and therefore it has to be met with an international body. The United Nations held a conference in Kyoto, Japan, just a few months ago. President Clinton said, sent Al Gore over there. Al Gore is the environmental fanatic. Right? He wrote a book called Earth in the Balance. And he called for the end of the internal combustion engine. That's your automobile. Right? That's your automobile, in addition to a lot of other machines. So the Kyoto conference came out and they said that uh, what we want to do is to reduce industrial activity down to a point where uh, we're at 1990 levels in the year 2010, or I I've forgotten it ex exactly, but it would mean a 25% reduction in industrial activity it would throw hundreds of thousands of people out of work and the wealth of America would be stifled, no doubt about it. Well, the Senate has said that they're not even going to try and, and, and put this thing through. This isn't going to even be, be brought up. And so President Clinton has announced that he will implement the provisions of the Kyoto Treaty by executive order, by presidential fiat. And if Congress doesn't stop him, we should blame ourselves for having that kind of congressman. Global warming. Ozone holes. I mean, this, is, this is so absurd. I mean, when you look at the chemistry involved, when you look at the physics, all of the science involved in this thing, there was a, a, a group of about 2,000 scientists that came out and said that, yes, global warming is a problem and ozone holes are a problem and so on. 2,000 of them. Turned out most of them were social scientists. Right? Recently, a man named Dr. Arthur Robinson out in... Uh, state of Oregon, spent several months of his life 
gathering the names of 15,000 genuine scientists saying global warming doesn't exist. So you got 15,000 reputable scientists versus 2,000, most of whom are social scientists. And you know, you would hope that that would be in your newspapers. You would hope that you would see information about that. There was a short blurb about it here and a short blurb there. But we still hear that global warming is a big problem, right? No, it's not. Nor is ozone. Ozone holes are not a big problem. Acid rain is, is a myth. Uh, there are places where people say, look, there's no fish in the lake. And you go and find out the lake has an Indian name from hundreds of years ago. And if you translate the Indian, it's fish with no lake, uh, lake with no fish. <laughs> I got tongue tied. <laughs> All right, so, but can environmental scares and threats propel people into wanting world government? That's my point. And the answer is absolutely. Well, what's the next threat? Well, we've seen this early in 1998, and this one will continue, you'll see. Chemical and biological warfare in the hands of rogue states and, and wild men who lead nations like Saddam Hussein or the people in North Korea or Assad in Syria or something like that. You know, I like to talk about they drag out somebody and he's the Hitler of the month, all right? <laughs> and he has his turn and then somebody else is the Hitler of the month and then this guy comes back and he's back and now he's the Hitler of the month again and, and he's going to threaten us and so on. All right, now that brings us down to the fifth. The fifth is China. Why do I have China on there? Well, China, is not, aren't they supposed to be our friends? Last September, Dr. Michael Pillsbury of the Pentagon He's a member of the National Defense University at the Pentagon in Washington. He testified before the United States Senate, September 18, 1997, Chinese views of future warfare, implications for the intelligence community. So he's telling the Senate what he has discovered. He's a China scholar. He reads Chinese, he translates it. He's actually translated a whole mess of Chinese military documents into a book this thick, 400 pages, which is called Chinese Views of Future Warfare. I have the book. Right. So he testified before the Senate last September. What did he say? He said that what he had discovered was alarming. He had discovered that the Chinese intend a revolution in military affairs where they're going to upgrade from conventional warfare to high-tech warfare. He said, indeed, numerous Chinese books and articles suggest an active research program has been underway for several years to examine how China should develop future military capabilities to defeat the United States. China's military capabilities in 20 years could pose major challenges to US forces. So while Mr. Clinton goes to China and exchange gifts and felicitations and honors with the bloodiest murderers the world has ever known, the red Chinese leaders, their military is gearing up to be able to defeat the United States within the next 20 years. And they, of course, know more about the ancient Chinese philosopher Sun Tzu than most Americans do. Sun Tzu is the man who said, Excellence in warfare is not to defeat your enemy. Excellence in warfare is to defeat him without ever having to go to battle. Right. Could China pose a threat to the United States that would propel Americans into wanting world government? Is China currently aiming missiles at the United States? Well, the CIA recently re released a report and I happened to be in Maine when the, the report showed up in the newspaper. Look at this headline in the Maine newspaper. Chinese missiles aimed at United States. White House officials discount CIA report. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, it's all there. And so I say that China could easily be the next threat. And there you have the kinds of threats. Now, mostly, in addition to threats, they are presenting us with false alternatives. They say, for instance, should we have Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic join NATO, or should we not because it might offend the Russians? There's your choice. 
What, isn't there another alternative? The other alternative is to let Poland have our seat and we're out of there, right? right? Here's the NATO handbook. NATO was formed in 1949. NATO is a subsidiary of the United Nations. Read the, the NATO charter in here. It's only 16 small articles. Five of them mention the United Nations. It always has been. It was formed as a military alliance against the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union doesn't exist anymore, and therefore NATO shouldn't either. Right? Even for its best reasons, it shouldn't exist anymore. But NATO has been converted into a political and economic force in addition to its supposed military capabilities. And it's under NATO that our forces are in Bosnia, which ultimately means they're under the United Nations. It shouldn't be. There's no authority for that in the Constitution of the United States. So there's a look at the conspiracy. The conspiracy that means to establish world government and destroy freedom for every single one of us. The sovereignty of our nation will be gone. Personal freedom will be gone. If we don't stop these people, they are accumulating more and more and more power. They have to be stopped. So how do we stop them? What do we do? Well, I have one more chart, and we have just a, a few more minutes, so we'll get to this one right away. We have a John Birch Society. The John Birch Society and its strategy is education, its weapon is the truth. And what do we mean to do with the John Birch Society? We mean to have the American people become aware. We agree with the prophet, the lament of the prophet Isaiah. He said, my people have gone into captivity for want of knowledge. Right? The thrust of it is, if they had been aware, then they would not have gone into captivity. So, education is our strategy, our weapon is the truth. We have a nationwide staff, people stationed across the country to help promote the aims and goals of the, the society within a, a geographic area. Concerted action, we say, look, don't everybody go off in 75 different directions. Yes, there are lots of concerns, but if everybody fights his own little pet peeve, nobody's gonna get anywhere. Let's get together and get behind a few very key moves, like get us out of the United Nations, stop foreign aid, make sure the Constitution is enforced, and so forth. We have the New American Magazine. I happen to be the publisher of the New American Magazine. This is our special issue on conspiracy for global control. The subscription is less than 100,000, but there have been, I think, almost 700,000 copies of this issue distributed throughout the country. We're looking for more of that. We have a speakers bureau. We fill engagements all across the country. We have bookstores owned and operated by members of our group in order to get titles into the general public that most of the chains won't carry. They're not interested in it. And so we have to start our own little bookstores. And some of them are uh, mail order out of somebody's home or somebody's office. And, and they do a lot of distribution. We produce audio and visual programs. This is all what you'd expect of an educational organization. We have some wonderful programs about the United Nations and its threat. You know, wh what we say in one video is that if you're pro-life, you better help us get out of the United Nations because the United Nations is pro-abortion. If you're pro-private ownership of weapons, you better help us get out of the UN, because the UN is against private ownership of weapons. If you're pro-private property, or if you're pro-private school, or if you're pro all of these different things, you better help us get out of the United Nations, because the United Nations is targeting your special interest. And everybody's special interest ought to be get us out of the United Nations. We publish our own books. We have our ad hoc committees. Our most prominent ad hoc committee is the report card on the congressman. Did he vote for higher taxes and more government? Did he vote for lower taxes and less government? And we distribute these by the tens and hundreds of thousands all across the country in that district, showing the voting record of the local congressman. It has quite an impact, especially when he comes to town meeting and everybody's waving one of these things in his face. <laughs> Mr. Congressman, you voted eight out of eight for higher taxes and more government. What's going on here? Well, you didn't, they didn't do the right votes. They didn't. <laughs> They didn't pick my good votes. You know. No, we picked the important votes. All right. So that's how we go about our business. At the end of the founding meeting, Robert Welsh, our founder, said, all we must find and build and use to win 
is sufficient understanding. He said, let's create that understanding and build that resistance with all that mortal men can put into the effort while there is still time. He said that in 1958, there was still time. Here we are in 1998, and there is still time, but not as much time. In fact, we're running out of time. The John Birch Society's slogan is, less government, more responsibility, and with God's help, a better world. We believe that combination will lead to a better world. And we're very anxious to see that happen. We want people to realize the, the masthead of our magazine says the purpose of it is that freedom shall not